Welcome and thank you for joining the Center for Creative Land Recycling at our webinar on Vision to Action or V to A. Uh, my name is Rachel Ross and I'm the Communications Coordinator for CCLEAR and I'll be moderating this webinar. Vision to Action is a model of community engagement which assisted many communities to facilitate over the years as part of their brownfields redevelopment process and we're excited to be doing our first webinar on the subject. I'm glad you could join us. So just a brief introduction of CCLEAR and what we do. Uh, we promote the sustainable, equitable, and responsible reuse of underutilized and environmentally impacted properties. And to this end, we advocate, educate, and assist redevelopment stakeholders. We are the technical assistance to Brownfields communities or TAB provider uh, for EPA regions um, 2, 9, and 10, and 12 states and territories. So more specifically, we provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, host events, provide resources through our newsletter and website, and we can assist you throughout the redevelopment process from getting started to finding funding, knowing the regulations, and then through to marketing your property and making connections to complete the final end use of the site. So just a bit of housekeeping um, before we get into the webinar content. Um, Thank you to APA Upstate New York chapter for accrediting this webinar for planners. And just a quick note that if you are planning to get credit for this webinar, you actually will need to check a box in our post webinar survey um, to receive that credit. And so that survey will pop up as soon as you close out of the webinar, it'll pop right up and just make sure that you take that step. We'll do about 45 minutes of uh, presentations from our speakers and then about 15 minutes of facilitated question and answer. And you can type in questions throughout the webinar into the box that's shown here in the circle on your dashboard. Um, in addition, you have a handout section on your dashboard that has a document about technical difficulties. So if you encounter any issues throughout the webinar, check out that document. It may be able to help you out. Um, you'll also see there the slides for the presentation, so feel free to download those. And there are also links to a Vision to Action um, fact sheet and to Vision to Action case studies, which we'll be discussing in the presentations, but you can see the full case studies there. So now to get into a little bit of why we're all here today. Um, a vision to action is one method of performing community engagement and community engagement is a really vital part of Brownfield's redevelopment projects and that process. And I wanna frame our discussion of community engagement within the context of environmental justice and the discrimination that communities of color have faced. Done right, a vision to action is a vehicle for inclusive community engagement. And so as we discuss you know, how to do a vision to action in the various tools, the number one goal and the thing to keep in your mind is to find a way to be inclusive and to check that you are bringing the whole diversity of people in your community uh, to the table and really empowering them to be a part of the planning process. So with that, I will introduce our speakers and we're very excited to have the team who performed a virtual vision to action in Pondre, Idaho here today to discuss that case study as well as specific tools and what a vision to action can look like. So first we'll hear from Ignacio De Riet. Ignacio coordinates CCLEAR's technical assistance program for redevelopment projects. He is a redevelopment expert with over 23 years of experience in public sector development. Ayano Healy will speak next and is a senior associate at Cascadia Partners, a firm CCLEAR has worked with for many vision to actions. Ayano is a public health urban planner who brings an interdisciplinary approach when working on projects of all scales and settings. She specializes in developing and implementing culturally responsive public engagement. And last but not least, Eric Brubaker has been the planning director of Pondre, Idaho since 2008. And as Pondre's first planning professional, his duties have been broad and have included building a new program from the ground up, as well as grant writing, community projects, parks, and transportation planning. So before I pass the baton to Ignacio, um, we're actually going to start with a quick Brownfields quiz question. So let me launch that poll. Um, 
And so you can choose uh, multiple of these. So choose as many as you think are correct. Um, you can use Brownfield's funding for any site on an environmental base other than a Superfund site that is owned by a responsible party, um, a vacant and underutilized site, government-owned surplus land, or a site proposed for affordable housing or a park. So I see the responses are coming in, so I'll give that a second. Great. Give it another, another minute. Awesome. So I'm going to close the poll. And share the results. Ignacio, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Can you see me? All right. Yes. So, uh, Rachel, can you close the poll? I'm, I'm getting the poll still on my screen. There you go. Thank you so much. And good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on when you're calling from. And I'm pleased to be here with Eric and Ayano. I think I met Eric the first time when he was actually just starting in Pondere at a workshop uh, when we were, I think we were in Montana that time. So glad to be here with both Eric and Ayano. Could you flip the slide, Rich? Mm -hmm. Oops. And so the so the, uh, as you saw from the results, we uh, uh, revisit them. It was 81% thought uh, any site on an environmental database, 82% vacant or un underutilized site, 55% government-owned surplus land, and 69% uh, for site proposed for affordable housing. Uh, the real answer really is you can pretty much use brownfields on any of these sites based on the circumstance. And uh, many of your communities, those of you calling in, have actually used brownfields funding for these type of sites. So it, for one, uh, one uh, misconception is a brownfield site has to be known as dirty or it has to be regulated. That is farthest from the truth. The, re, uh, the real purpose of brownfields funding is to revitalize communities and get those sites that are underutilized, vacant, or otherwise could be used for better purposes to be to be uh, to, to get through the process and take away all uh, any doubts about reusing it. So um, so please, uh, when you hear brownfields, don't um, don't run away from it. These are opportunities. And one way of figuring out what the opportunities of these brownfields are is using a vision to action uh, process or engagement process. And, uh, and, and vision to action really is a way to gather ideas from different sectors of the community, whether in person or virtually, of what the possibilities are on one site, or a corridor, a neighborhood, or maybe entire a downtown or a district, or maybe even the entire city. It really depends on what your purpose is and what stage of your engagement process and planning process you're in. It's a way to collaborate from different parts of the community, again, both staff, residents, community groups, even regulators, so within your community and outside the community. Uh, and the process involves uh, you know, talking about what, the, what strengths, weaknesses of a community are, uh, what people's aspirations are, and uh, what investments can be brought in, and what tools can be used and funds can be used to, to get towards those goals. It's also a great uh, way to bring in underrepresented uh, communities into the process, especially uh, for those that have difficulty going into uh, setting aside time uh, during their busy lives. Uh, and I'm going to explain that further. So it's a, it's a, it, uh, and as Eric will explain to you, it really does help uh, bring uh, participation into the process. Next slide.
So uh, what are the objectives and goals of a uh, vision to action? Again, convene people. Uh, and uh, in some cases, diffuse conflict and bring mutual parties into the discussion. Uh, there are many communities uh, or instances where communities might be polarized over a certain issue. And uh, during this process, it's a way to bring other voices in, other goals in, look at the big picture, because in many uh, communities, people sometimes get dug in into issues and there are many other uh, circumstances that have to be brought in. So bringing those considerations in actually helps diffuse uh, uh, volatile uh, situations. You can gather impressions of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of a community. And SWOT is a, a term you'll uh, come across uh, during these processes. And that's a key ingredient in figuring out how to move forward from where you are. It's to generate ideas from different sectors, both on uh, really what the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities are of a community, but alternatives for reuse, ideas, uh, in a more in a neutral uh, setting, uh, and raise awareness to what other people think about the community. I mean, people come uh, who are new to a community, or people who have been there for a long time, have different impressions on the community, of the neighborhood, and bringing those ideas in really does help a lot. And discussing feasible feasible strategies for funding, planning, and implementing any ideas that are generated during the process. Next slide. So what does a, a virtual, uh, a, a V2A look like? So it comes in several forms and it doesn't have to be called a vision to action. It could be called a charrette, it could be called a community meeting, it could be called a workshop. It comes in many terms, but we use the uh, term V2A in C clear because it's, uh, or vir vision to action, it's, it, you know, it gives the impression that we're moving forward. And so uh, there are a number of ways of doing it. Uh, asynchronous, meaning it could be an ongoing survey on a website or you know, just a regular survey on paper and it's, it's distributed. People get put responses in and those are generated. Responses are uh, received over time and then analyzed. Uh, it could include uh, some form of GIS analysis, a GIS tool. And uh, in the background to a lot of ideas, uh, the ideas that are brought in can be uh, used further to do analysis so that when there are live meetings in person or virtual, these ideas can be brought out and presented in a logical or legible or organized mat uh, manner so that, you know, uh, all ideas are put in a more presentable and uh, and maybe common themes can uh, can be identified and presented and maybe drive towards the solutions you're driving at. So uh, an example of this again is you can do an oral online survey, several online surveys, uh, or you can do paper surveys and uh, gather information and in the background the planners, uh, financial people, architects, they can get this information, think up where the common themes are. And when it comes uh, time to come together in person or virtually, you can have these presentations online or in person. Uh, and it, this happens in community events, in information booths. Uh, you, can uh, you, can, you can integrate this. Uh, they're great for open houses or street fairs. Uh, and it's it's an interactive process where you get all the ideas that have been generated over time and get feedback based on what the attendees at the live event uh, can uh, react to. So next slide. And uh, again, what, what are these methods that we use? Uh, again, surveys. And during live events, we can have uh, breakout groups. Uh, breakout groups can have include table surveys, exercises, and reporting back to the big to the larger audience. Uh, you've probably seen uh, workshops where they use building blocks and or Lego. Uh, these are good tools when you're reimagining your neighborhoods. 
there are mapping exercises where you either use paper maps or virtual maps uh, or even GIS uh, to uh, uh, identify SWOT or even uh, certain features that you'd like to see in the community. Uh, this particular drawing is with these uh, what ideas of uh, in Fairbanks where they said, well, these are the boundaries of a district or a neighborhood or this of downtown and that that's the outline of these drawings uh, you've probably seen posters and sticky notes where people just go around with sticky notes or dots and they identify uh, different aspects of what's being asked in the poster and they're also sim actual simulations so you can get very techy and uh, use 3D generation or even a virtual reality type uh, gadgets that people can wear and reimagine in a neighborhood. These are all uh, tools that are used in these charrettes and group exercises. Uh, next slide. So how to perform a, a vision to action? Well, it's good to start knowing where you are. I mean, uh, it, it, this usually is initiated by local government, but Community groups can do this too, uh, or a coalition uh, of community groups and the government, uh, maybe some in, in, uh, community, uh, outside community interests. You have to know where you're starting from and what aspect of the community you'd really like to investigate. And you have to set some goals. What do you want out of, your, uh, out of this planning process? What do you want out of the visioning process? Uh, it involves some type of prioritization, whether it's prioritiz prioritizing future events, future meetings, future projects, future um, activities to get uh, grants or uh, and, and other uh, other goals. Uh, it takes some consensus building. You can't move forward if you can't come to some agreement. Uh, you don't need unanimous agreement but it's something that you want to get the, the major issues out so that decision makers can help uh, have informed decisions as they move forward in some ways it's a waste uh, it's a way to raise funds as you mentioned grants uh, or raising uh, it from private entities or foundations and there are really prerequisites at, at cclear when we conduct visioning uh, exercises we would like the leadership uh, whether it's city council or department heads, tribal councils, uh, heads of nonprofits, to be uh, uh, at least to participate and support the effort. Not exactly the, the end goals, but really just the effort. It, it's important to have that. And you need staff commitment. You know, see clear, we are, uh, we are all outsiders, consultants are outsiders, architects, we're all, uh, are all outsiders, and we need the com commitment of the staff that's going to drive this process. They might not like what we hear uh, or our suggestions, but it's still commitment to some end goal in the process. It also, you, you need a location that you're trying to improve, whether it's a site, a neighborhood, a corridor, or, or the whole downtown or the city and what ideas you're trying to work around because these are the frameworks of what the visioning process will take uh, next slide so what are the logistics well you have to think again well, something here is what's your budget you know where uh what you're willing to spend or or if you have funds uh, available or you can solicit uh, to fund these events. So figure out what events you're looking at, uh, at whether they're workshops, they're public meetings, you know, during a regular council meeting, you set aside uh, some time for some kind of official time. You can have workshops, open houses, charrettes, perhaps you participate in a street fair and you, yeah, you table it. Uh, Again, uh, are you looking at the scale of the project and what methods of, and tools you're willing, uh, uh, you, you'd like to use, you've seen used and investigate how much it costs to use those tools and Ayano will get into these. And the funding sources uh, to conduct visioning, it varies. Uh, it can be 
contributions from the municipal government or local contributions. We've had uh, chambers of commerce contribute some of these efforts. Uh, there's, uh, there's technical assistance and consulting available through CCLEAR and our uh, TAB providers. So if you're not in uh, uh, EPA regions 2, 9, and 10, uh, the other regions, they have what are called technical assistance to brownfield providers that offer some form of assistance. Or your EPA region, or your EPA brownfields team actually does have some resources that they can, uh, they can uh, contribute to the effort. And we have private parties. We've even had responsible parties contribute to these efforts. And you can mix and match them. So you might uh, have a visioning or community exercise for an idea and you, you, you set this aside and perhaps you can get uh, assistance from another group or another fund uh, in-kind assistance and you can mix and match these and uh, move forward. So don't make this a one-shot deal. Uh, try to build all these efforts so you're going through uh, you're uh, going through a process and toward a goal and and that's again why it's important to have your municipal government because in the end these plans will end up in some general plan or specific plan or neighborhood plan and you want this uh, kind of within the program that the municipal government goes government goes back to as you're moving forward and trying to improve your, uh, you know, improve your community. So the next slide, I think this, okay, so a couple of case studies. Uh, this is a case study we did a couple of, uh, uh, four years ago now uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska. They had a nine year old general plan that you no, know, they weren't too happy with. So it was really a do over of their downtown plan. And uh, they really didn't really agree on what the bound, uh, boundaries of their downtown were, what land uses they wanted, the infrastructure to support those uses, and, uh, and also the transportation uh, that might be support the densities and the reuse that they wanted in their community. So uh, they came to see clear and uh, with uh, with Cascadia, actually, we brought Cascadia in. Uh, we had the visioning session, and our visioning session really the output that the uh, the borough. So it was Fair, uh, Fairbanks North Star Borough. They basically said we want a series of maps that will inform our general plan, uh, our, our downtown planning. So that's what we did. We didn't really have a recommendation. We said uh, you know, we gathered the community. And uh, and we we delivered to uh, the north the borough a set of plans which uh, outlined uh, the community's impressions of their SWAT uh, and you know their impressions of what uses they wanted around their downtown. And so right now uh, they are uh, in, currently working on this downtown uh, the downtown plan. So that's one issue. It was very uh, specific. It was a big, uh, you know, we started the big picture. So that's one, uh, that's one way of doing a visioning process. Uh, next slide. Now, here's an issue in Brawley, California, where uh, a property owner that was not the original uh, responsible party, they acquired the site. So they became a successor in interest to the site. But this is a case where uh, the site had been vacant for decades and they had finally started doing a cleanup plan, but the cleanup plan was stalled because the, it, was, it became very contentious. There were neighborhood interests, there were interest group interests, the regulatory agency wanted to resolve this and, uh, and and the responsible party as well wanted to uh, move forward. Uh, they were stored, stalled for too long. So at the request of the municipal government and the regulator, CCLEAR came in uh, with Cascadia and we uh, tried to diffuse the uh, polarized ideas that weren't exactly local. Uh, there, of course, there were uh, other, uh, there were, issues to uh, these global 
uh, common interest, but then the goal was to move forward and get this site cleaned up because there were existing conditions on the site that could that we could not move forward with. Uh, uh, and moving forward would mean going to the site and cleaning it up two or three times, which would be fair, very inefficient. So we did the visioning uh, process. Uh, it wasn't pretty, but there was a process. A CCLEAR prepared a report where we evaluated three and go uh, three uh, possible reuse alternatives on the site and costed out what these looked like. So look, we looked at back of the envelope gap financing of what uh, an industrial cleanup looked like, a residential cleanup looked like, and something in between. And based on our recommendations uh, that were adopted, uh, something close to it, the site is finally getting cleaned up and and the in between uh, goal that we you know we suggested uh, is now being implemented. We don't know exactly where on that in between they're ending up. So because we didn't say do this design, we said the design could look something like this, and and that's what they're implementing right now. And so this uh, this case study is in your handout, uh, and uh, you can. Uh, uh, look at it for future reference. So those are my case studies. I think, uh, next slide. So before I hand it over to Ayano, I have another survey. So uh, if we could open up the survey. Now, both of these events were live. Uh, Ayano and uh, and Eric will describe a virtual event, but we could have done this virtually as well. So over the past year, there's been some virtual, a lot of virtual uh, engagement going on. So select one of the following. Uh, how often have you used these virtual tools? And um, So we'll give you, uh, so wait till half of you have answered. We're at half, so we can share the poll and the responses. And there you go. A quarter of you haven't. A third of you have done it once or twice. Some of you have done it more than that. Congratulations. And some of you do it a lot of the time. So great. I think this is something, uh, as you look, at what happened in Pondere, I think you might learn some more and you might even consider it more. So Ayano, take it away. Thanks, Ignacio. Yeah, um, pleasure to be on this panel today. And yeah, it's good to see that um, we have a range of, of experience using virtual tools, like Ignacio said, um, you know, while we had to make some adjustments in this past year, but um, it feels like there's a lot of things that we can learn and continue forward um, now that we have those both virtual tools for engagement and our kind of traditional in-person tools. So kind of maybe that's a silver lining in all of this. Um, so uh, before I go on, we can go to the next slide. I just want to share a quick um, bio about Cascadia with you all. Um, Cascadia Partners is a full service urban planning real estate environmental sustainability and public engagement cult consulting firm in Portland. And we really use those skills to provide both uh, like a sophisticated analysis of project needs and then package in it into hopefully compelling visual stories that can bring the project to life and engage participants whenever it's needed. So on the next slide, um, I wanna just highlight, you know, kind of a typical project arc that Cascadia has used, you know, with vision to action projects, but really universally. And like uh, Ignacio pointed out, um, you know, a big part of that process is convening stakeholders. Um, we do this, and an example of what we what that kind of looks like is on the left to the slide. Um, we are uh, convening ex internal and external stakeholders, um, you know, in different ranges, and have found a lot of success with doing things in breakout rooms, or we can convene you know, small conversations and really bring together, like this example here, a diverse group of perspectives and identities to understand what are some shared priorities or where are some things that we don't share. Um, all the while, you know, scribing those virtually on a board 
um, you know, it's activities like this, and then um, this map kind of graphic that you can see here um, that we use frequently to understand, you know, what are the community's assets and what are the issues. And um, we really rely on stakeholders to help us with understanding that. Sometimes we ask them to, you know, do it map-based and spatially show us those hotspots that are of concern or of like, you know, that we covet and we want to preserve moving forward. Um, doing that kind of SWOT analysis, like Ignacio mentioned, is important to know how can we really elevate those ideas. And that's kind of the example first to the right, is that we, we process all this information we've gathered through polling surveys or breakout groups or things like that. And then we elevate the themes that come to the top to really showcase, okay, these are the priorities of the community and maybe, um, you know, these are the options for a potential future use or, you know, future next step for that project. Um, these are all the real key parts of what we, um, how we shape our process and understand what we're working towards. On the next slide, there are also two more important considerations um, that we make. And so if you can advance to the next slide, I can share kind of a little bit more about that. Um, great. And those considerations um, are first and foremost, you know, understanding what's really possible at the beginning of the project. Um, you know, that's a conversation to have with all of the important internal project core team to run, really understand what are the political and financial guardrails that the um, that our project and all of the engagement we should do should stay within. Um, important to kind of, you know, um, level set that before you want to ask the public for their opinion because you don't want to promise anything that we can't deliver on. Um, and last but not least, um, a final important consideration when we're doing our you know, V2A processes is always thinking about how is our engagement approach and methods accessible and to whom? And if we are really wanting to engage a specific kind of you know, segment of the population, we need to think about um, and not assume that everyone has the same computer or internet access or might have the same level of you know, shared language or digital literacy to engage in any sort of um, virtual or remote kind of um, public activity. And then lastly, you know, shaping, we shape our strategies by understanding you know, what's the history of um, engaging this particular community or the community broadly? Is there any reasons for distrust, um, you know, in a public process or just simply feeling the public might feel like, why would you ask me for my opinion? And so all of those things and, and kind of working through an inventory and assessment of that helps us better curate the process so that it can really reach the people we mean to and get the results that we hope for. Um, so on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, key elements of engagement um, that we usually need to have in our process, and then some of the tools that we usually look to and especially have looked to within the last year of, um, you know, to make these things happen. So um, it's always important, especially when trying to develop a poll or a survey to understand, you know, what kind of data or information are you looking to gather from stakeholders? Um, there's all sorts of options out there and each one kind of, you know, has an emphasis of what it can do well. Like if you're asking for, if you if it's important to ask for space, uh, spatial based kind of feedback, you know, there's platforms for that. Or if you might want something that is really visually compelling, there's great platforms that really showcase maybe example images or graphics that you've developed for that particular project. Um, we also have re, uh, frequently used tools that help with you know, live polling, whether it's in a virtual meeting or it could be in an in-person meeting in the future, of course. Um, virtual polling tools you know, is, are easy for people to access just through a link on their phone. And then you can kind of get temperature checks in the room if you're doing a large presentation and you want to kind of get uh, people's sentiment a long way. So that's an important, uh, another tool that we use often and we've used often in the past year. Um, you know, similar to that, we're all in a position where we're trying to communicate, you know, the project information, why are we even asking 
the public to be involved and all this sort of background context um, with the public. And so it's always important to see, you know, how much, how much do we want to invest on, um, you know, communicating that. And so online open house platforms or, you know, specific platforms that can host all of the project information is another really useful tool that we've used in the past um, for particularly technical or involved projects. Um, you know, when we're thinking about, okay, when we've convened stakeholders and we're in the meeting together, how can we replicate and simulate, um, you know, in-person kind of benefits of, you know, brainstorming and scribing and things like that. And we've really looked to a number of virtual whiteboards is what I'll call them um, for doing that so that, you know, stakeholders feel like their contributions are literally being heard and made note of up on the screen. And there's a lot of, again, options that depending on what kind of note taking you'd like to do, you can, you know, do scribing or you can do actual virtual sticky notes. It's a lot of fun. And there's a lot of more opportunities quite simply because you can do it virtually. Um, you know, on the note of kind of communicating your projects, uh, goals or background or things like that, We've found a lot of success in, um, you know, because we can't be in person and engage with people, we found a lot of success in um, creating other compelling ways of conveying and packaging information, like uh, creating animated videos or um, developing uh, web-based application programs where people can, you know, engage in your project kind of in a game-like activity through a phone-based or desktop-based app. Um, and then I want to call out um, just some of the tools for uh, virtual engagement that we might all already have or not know that we have, um, just through simple um, like access to subscriptions like Zoom or if you use Google Meet. Um, this sort of using Zoom's um, interpretation configuration has been a big part um, of why we've been successful with convening meetings with multiple languages uh, multiple language speakers all in one place. Um, closed captioning also helps with accessibility so that people can read screens and rather than having to have audio on or rely just on that. Um, so those are just some tools in a snapshot. And on the next slide, or the next few slides, I will um, kind of go quickly through some examples of projects that we're currently working on um, that kind of utilize some of these engagement methods I've covered, and then also are kind of pursuing the same kind of V2A goals that Ignacio um, outlined earlier. So this Vance Park project, I'm calling it PLUS, because um, it actually started as um, a V2A project, and that's how Cascadia got involved. And that was about 2017. Um, but since then, um, this project, which has always been a planning and development project, for a 90-acre brownfield site in um, Multnomah County, um, it's evolved to now, um, you know, build off of the V2A process um, to continue to engage stakeholders in a more, you know, deeper, meaningful way. And actually, the model we developed was to identify, essentially, leaders in the community who are natural, trusted. Um, entities and can basically be trained and understand the project and then go back into their communities basically as ambassadors of the project. Um, these community leaders are essentially gatekeepers and have been one of the biggest ways that, uh, you know, the evolution of this project has been successful in reaching uh, uh, communities with different, you know, languages. Uh, this, this area actually there's over 70 different languages spoken by residents in, in Eastern in East Portland. So, um, you know, community leaders have helped with um, administering surveys, translating them into multiple languages and doing them both, you know, traditional paper surveys in ways that in COVID safe ways, um, online surveys and also doing phone surveys. And so this kind of model um, has been really great to reach, particularly hard to reach communities. Um, yeah, the next slide is another example of kind of a visioning process um, that's in, uh, in Central California. Um, it's actually a transportation and community scenario planning process that we're currently um, working with uh, 
the Council of Governments on to um, both you know, meet state and federal requirements of what this mandated process expects, but then also try to engage the public and other key stakeholder groups in a bigger visioning exploratory kind of process because you know we want to keep moving the needle further here and um, because we're trying to introduce some really big um, and abstract concepts to a lot of different people with familiarity with scenario planning process it's required a lot of um, of time and, and energy relying on what are the best virtual facilitation tools that we can use to help convey information to give people the right kind of level of context, but then ask them for their input, hopefully in a meaningful way rather than a tokenistic way. Um, and ways that we've done this is the examples on this slide show <clears throat> kind of a snapshot of one of the videos we made. And then to the right of that, this is just a snapshot of a mural board that we were able to do some digital sticky notes and, and live scribing at a particular working group meeting. The last slide um, is my final example um, of another project we're cu currently working in. And this one is um, another one that has a lot of, um, it's, a, it's a very important, uh, historically significant site in Portland that um, actually has now evolved to be a venue for um, you know, large public trade shows and community events. Um, but because of the in intersection of its uh, rich history and then the you know benefit that it creates for a lot of small business owners and things like that um, we've had to engage a, a very broad range of stakeholders with different priorities and interests um, but all very much invested in what the future of this site is since um, the goal for the regional government is to make sure that um, future development can both improve community and economic benefit so Again, this was a lot of um, process um, that, that spent time on understanding people's values and guiding principles and where those all intersect, no matter what stakeholder, stakeholder you are. Um, and so those, again, used a lot of virtual engagement tools and as well as um, an educational app. When we got to a phase where we learned enough information about um, you know, stakeholder priorities, what's possible with this particular site. We convened it all into this app and use that as kind of a starting point for stakeholders to use and educate themselves on what's possible. Um, from that point, we then have had a series of meetings to help discuss, okay, what do you think about these things? And kind of return uh, to, you know, these small breakout group, group discussions and understand what rises to the top. So those, those are quick and dirty of some examples um, from what Cascadia does and how we kind of use the vision to action goals and objectives as, as a real um, you know, complementary path to how we do a lot of our projects here. And now I think I will pass it on to Eric, um, but maybe ask one polling question before we move on. Are we waiting to do that? I think we might be waiting to do that. I think we're waiting to do that polling question. Great, okay, take it away, Eric. Thank you, Ayano. Um, so this is a picture of Pondre, Idaho from Schweitzer Mountain. We are in rural North Idaho. It is just a beautiful place to live. Um, we got a lot going for us. We got the mountains and the lake but not everything is as rosy in our community. So next slide. One of the things that I want to introduce everybody to is our two miles of lakeshore. We are cut off from the lake by an active railroad line. And on the other side of that railroad line is our brownfield site called the Black Rock. Um, first, a little bit about myself. Next slide. So this is me. This is what a small town planning and community development director does on the weekends. This was a few years back at our city cleanup. But 
We are very much a small rural community, former, former um, natural resource extraction economy, transitioning to <clears throat> both the combination of tourism and um, they kind of call it a Zoom town where people are relocating for amenities. Um, and so we do have we do have a lot of growth in our community right now, and we're trying to make the most of that. Next slide. So these are typical Ponderay kids. This is what we do. If you see these two, they're gonna walk across those railroad tracks and they're gonna walk down that path to the lake to go fishing. Next slide. They will fish off of a makeshift dock and enjoy themselves. If you look way in the distance, you might see on this slide, a couple of highlights. You'll see Sandpoint and some a large condominium project that you really can't make out in the picture, but just know that our sister city of Sandpoint is, is larger than Pondere and is a little bit more well-known, but we try to work together and one of the things we work together on is this Brownfields Coalition Assessment Grant that looked at the two miles of shoreline. And it is one of our major assets and also one of our current liabilities. So next slide. So we got here because over a hundred years ago, there was a smelter. And that's why Ponderay is here, that's why we have our brownfields site and basically they used to smelt minerals and dump the results over the shoreline of the lake and that is what's known as black rock today next slide the little timeline we with uh, our neighbor cities in bonner county were awarded a coalition assessment grant from the epa and as a result of that, we were able to identify our site as having high levels of lead contamination. Um, as I got to, to know the Brownfields program a little bit, one of the things that became clear is we needed a to do some planning. And we were, as a city, awarded a planning grant in 2014 from a private foundation, the Lore Foundation. And we set out on a planning process next slide <clears throat> then one of the things that i will admit is as a planner i want to do great things and and one of the things you might see really clearly in this slide is that Ponderay doesn't have a really defined downtown. The other thing you'll notice is we do not have the value of the lake propagating into the community. And that's largely because we were cut off by the railroad tracks. And so using this methodology and a lot of modern planning principles of trying to create vibrant community, solid economic development. We set out on a sub area plan and I'll take you to the next slide. Our, our sub area plan was quite ambitious, but we looked at potential redevelopment and it basically gives Ponderay a presence on the shoreline and, and future opportunities for marina and community development and had everything that the planners are doing really solid um walkable vibrant downtown core <clears throat> um next slide you can kind of see see the process where we fit this into our existing grid of our community Next slide. We had a green belts plan and a pathways plan to go along with it. We're in a coordinated way working with the Pondere Bay Trail, which is a connection between our town and the city of Sandpoint. Next slide. 
So this plan was really pretty cool. I I really liked it, and we were we were in fact featured in the June 2018 edition of Planning Magazine. Um, it was very ambitious, but we had a little bit of a problem. And I take you to the next slide. When when you look around the room in our Charette presentation, one of the things that you might notice is the people that participated were what I call our usual suspects. And that's the people who are actively engaged in the community, our planning commission, our mayor and council, um, folks from the nonprofit Friends of the Bay Trail and a few property owners and, and business owners. And these are our bread and butter. These are the people who care passionately about the community of Pend Oreille. But the reality was not everybody was involved. And when we had the rolled out our plans to the community, there was a lot of pushback. In particular, there was a new city council um, and we're bringing them up to speed and start going through the, the big grand plan. And next slide, <clears throat> all they could see was, oh, you're going to do this to us. You're going to do something to us. You're going to do condos. These are, this is a picture of the season's condos, which happened just down the shoreline in Sandpoint. And I think a lot of people generally were afraid. If you look at the little picture in the corner that this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna drop something really big and dramatically change your neighborhood. So for us, it was back to the drawing board time. And one of the things that that we recognized and, and saw was really important was making sure that we <clears throat> brought the community to us. So next slide, you'll see pictures of Pondere Neighbor Day. And so what this was is an event that the city had, a harvest festival that basically brought the community to us and we surveyed them. And the results of that survey showed that what people really wanted was what they've always had, was a natural area, parks, um, limited redevelopment, limited economic development. Go ahead to the next slide. You'll see results of the survey from Neighbor Day, and they were not as interested in the hotel, resort, uh, lakeside cottages. People were more interested in the natural shoreline. So for the for us, go on to the next slide, and I'll talk about what we did with this information. So here we are. We had re-engaged the community, and we were feeling like we're back on track. Um, we had a lot of things going for us. We were awarded a Brownfields Multipurpose Grant, which included opportunities for both area-wide planning and for cleanup. And then in November, we'd taken this, um, this outreach and we put together a proposal and the voters passed a 1% sales tax. Um, and so we had a lot going for us. And then next slide, here comes COVID, right? So just about the time we were supposed to start our area-wide planning, throws us a curveball, but we had resources. We reached out, we knew that there were folks out there like Ignacio and the technical assistance to Brownfields program. And we reached out and they said, yeah, we'll set you up with um, something we've been wanting to do anyway, with some virtual visioning. So it's like, let's do it. And we, worked with Cascadia Partners on a virtual visioning plan. We sent out mailers to everyone in the community. We made it approachable so folks couldn't use their technology or their computers. They'd come into City Hall and fill out a super simple, um, really approachable virtual visioning. It was a format that basically, if you go to the next slide, you'll see it, one of 11 questions um, that were really easy to understand and clear. 
So we basically really blew the door open, made everybody in the community feel like they were um, not only welcome to participate, but that we really wanted everyone's voice to be heard. And then we had the next slide shows the mapping program, which for folks who are more interested, it was optional, so not everyone thinks this way, but for people who wanted to really participate and dig in spatially, they were able to do that. Um, Cascadia then brought us, took us those results, and sometime around September, things were really starting to open up in the community. Um, so we were able to have our neighbor day. We had, you know, people showed up in masks and the groups were a little smaller, but we were able to have an event um, and take the results of that virtual visioning and ground truth it and turn it into next steps for our community. So I just want to thank um, Ignacio, Ayano, and everyone who helped make this possible for us. I think the, the message that I wanted to bring forward or take home is that this is something that while we did it as a result of COVID, um, the reality is it made participation much easier and we were able to really open the door to a lot of people in the community by using these virtual tools and I would do it again, COVID or not. So next slide. Thank you to everyone for participating. Thank you for um, your interest in this program and I think we may have another question before we take off. Yes, we have one more poll question. Um, so I'll just launch that quickly. So if people are still on the line, um, the last question is, how do you think you will continue to incorporate virtual community engagement in the future? We're excited to see how uh, this webinar may have changed things for you. So I'll let people vote. And in the meantime, please submit any questions that you have. Uh, we may extend a little bit longer to answer those if you have any. All right, I'm gonna close the poll and share the results. So it looks like um, about 85% said combine virtual engagement uh, in the future with in-person events, which is great. Um, so it sounds like there's a lot of interest in these virtual tools, which is awesome. So someone said in the questions, we call them the STP, the same 10 people. So it sounds like there's also uh, some uh, you know, understanding of, of Eric's Eric's piece of the presentation. Um, so I hope that this uh... Rachel, we can't hear you. So I think your connection might be bad. Okay, let's see. I will see if there are any questions, uh, un unless Rachel. Actually, I don't see any questions in the. Uh, you lose me. Oh no. I can hear you now. Okay, great. It says I've been restored. Sorry about that. Um, and I'm going to leave my webcam off because I'm having internet issues. So I'm going to formally close, but if people want to stick around and ask questions um, for another 10 minutes or so, we can do that. But I'll just go through, you know, how to note that uh, you're interested in Avita A and some of the upcoming opportunities that we have. Um, so like Ignacio addressed, you know, we're the we're the technical assistance provider for um, regions two, nine, and ten. And so if you're interested in doing a vision to action, you can and should the opportunity arise that Seaclear is able to perform vision to action, you can note your interest in the survey, which will pop up when you close the webinar. 
Um, and we also have these two upcoming webinars here um, that we hope to see you at. One is on preparing a, a competitive Brownfields, EPA Brownfields grant, and the next one is on um, federal funding and the uh, budget and opportunities for Brownfields funding in the future. Yeah. Yeah, and I just like to add, yeah, the new administration does is focusing on a lot of issues that are covered under V2A. So there's going to be uh, a lot of funding available, actually, at least we anticipate. So uh, tune into both webinars. So uh, if you're interested in any kind of planning, assessment, or cleanup uh, process. Okay, so let's see. There are some questions coming in. Um, Okay, we actually have a couple questions about conflict. So um, for Ayano, what are some of the tools that you found most useful when diffusing conflict between groups? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think nothing, nothing super technological, just listening <laughs> as the first thing and, and creating a meeting format and whatever your forum is, designing it in a way where you can be very clear both during the meeting and by the actions you take and how you develop that meeting, that all perspectives are welcome. Because I think the biggest thing for people is just wanting to make sure that they feel like they're being heard. Um, there's definitely polarizing projects we've we've had and we're currently working on right now. But um, you know, when if you use both you know tools like uh, the virtual whiteboarding tools that I was kind of mentioning before. Um, to first like capture people's thoughts and feelings, concerns, um, you know, that's, that's one part of it, but then it really relies on the facilitator and the design of your meeting to show that, you know, pull and tease out what are their maybe underlying threads that people have in common that they didn't realize or that people can all basically agree and live with. Maybe not everyone has to agree enthusiastically, but they could live with possible solutions. So I think that succinctly is um, my response. Yeah, and actually just to add, and using Eric's project as an example, I think I recall a few years ago when I heard about the, the uh, concern over having massive condos uh, on the shoreline, which really wasn't the interest of the community, but wasn't quite being reflected in the, re in, in the uh, initially before they had their last set of outreach. So uh, expanding the audience and stakeholder base is really important in doing this. And, and that's where you, you don't get the same 10 people in the room. That's why you widen it up, you open it up during the street fair and you'd open it up during online engagement. And again, something online engagement is uh, cheaper than others and you find the tool that probably works best for you. And, and maybe Eric can enlighten us on how the uh, the neighborhood day may have sparked interest or at least even knowledge of what was going on. I'll, I'll pop in. I think, you know, Ayano said it best when it's make sure people feel heard and and are actually and are actually heard. I think that's that's the biggest thing because then that gives us a, a starting point from which we can create compromises and create create solutions where people understand maybe everyone's not going to get everything that they want, but we're all going to get a lot out of this, and and they see that they were they were heard. So a neighbor day, one of the things that was really cool it was a tactical approach to planning where we actually laid out this harvest fair with the street grid that we were proposing so that people could actually imagine where the underpass would be to the lake and then we could ask them questions about it like oh yeah this gives us a little sense of uh it centers our community and people like that yeah and just an ex another example of a polarized situation that was brawley so i, I suggest you read the brawley case study that's a case where you know there were two uh, cleanup scenarios and this is a case where how clean is clean it is a, a big question and uh and so uh 
I'll leave it at that. Uh, read a case study and the follow up with questions if you if you have any. Yes, yeah, so we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, how do you alert people to the presence of an online survey, particularly those who do not follow social media accounts? And then sort of a related question is um, the usual suspects are usually older and does the virtual tools let you tap into a younger stakeholder? So maybe sort of address the you know, discrepancy between virtual and age. Ayano, do you wanna go first? Sure, happy to. Um, yeah, I think that especially when designing a poll um, for the community that maybe um, you might develop it to be a virtual, virtually based survey, but that, you know, knowing if your audience might have some digital literacy issues or something like that, just, act, you know, limited access for whatever reason, um, thinking ahead about that and planning that, that poll or survey to um, be easily administered over the phone or something that could be due asynchronously like Ignacio had brought up before that, um, you know, maybe it's like um, kind of in a public setting where there is in, there's ways to engage people by simply like weighing in with a bean counter kind of thing. Um, it really depends on what your key questions are. Um, but I think that if you know if you know who your audience is, you can kind of design back from there to make sure that whatever um, outreach tool you're using can be adaptable and just um, as impactful with asking and conveying information. Yeah, and again, uh, Ayano and I brought, I think I brought up uh, the Van Spark. I, that actually started as a one uh, vision to action and became another. And that's a case where uh, we went to the community. We went to their, uh, uh, we uh, it was also a time when uh, there was a crackdown on immigrants and we had uh we had uh, a population that was concerned that they would be uh apprehended and deported so we went to them and uh and we had workshops in several languages uh, we went to their place of uh meeting and uh set it up so that it's more friendly to them Great. Um, so one person asks, for a majorly contaminated site, uh, we don't want to necessarily engage the community until we have a solution to the situation. How do you engage but not engage for fear of providing too much information? Um, it may be that we have no choice. Uh, who to give ownership of the property? How do we conduct community engagement? when we don't want to share the information we have. Ignacio, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, yeah, I guess it depends. Uh, if it's a publicly available information, they're going to find out sooner or later, and withholding it might not be the best thing. Uh, if it's not yet public, you know, that, that would be a different issue. But I think this is worth a follow-up. But uh, for us, it's it's C clear, and if it's already in a regulatory agency, if it's been tested and it's reportable, it's got to be disclosed, uh, especially if there's a health impact. Uh, if it's an emergency, then that really elevates it, and it goes beyond visioning. It really goes to public health, which is really a different issue. If it's public health related, let the regulators decide. If it's a planning issue and it's not immediately actionable, then that's something that visioning might be better for. But if, if it's a health concern, I think uh, visioning takes us a back seat to the health concerns. Okay. Does anyone else have anything to add to that question? Yeah, I might add briefly, um, you know, especially going back to this Vans project, like. Ignacio mentioned it. It started as a V2A process, but yet we're here four years later, um, still working on a on an iteration of that project. Um, and that, you know, um, when when engaging the public, we've learned a lot with all of the previous engagement efforts. But the site itself is still there's a lot of unknowns, right? And like the question points to, what's um, how do we 
appropriately engage people without giving them too much information or promising things that we can't deliver on. And um, I think a big part of that was for this Vance project in particular, um, in our wave of more recent engagement, um, looking to leaders in the community to help with filtering out and weighing in, okay, what's the right level of information? Uh, you know, we're trained, the consultant and uh, client team works together to help train and educate those leaders on, you know, maybe all of the information or more than they would really need, but then they're the decision makers and gatekeepers of what's most relevant to bring to their respective communities and what is worthwhile to ask. Um, and so that is all couched within the bigger kind of assumption that being very clear during the process that we're asking we're asking for your input we want to generally hear what you think but that there's there's no um, there's a lot of unknowns here and that we will we want to keep these priorities in mind when we understand more information down the line and I think it's just simply being transparent in that um, what you do know and don't know at that point to respect people's time to engage and give their opinion. Okay, great. Um, someone commented, once Pondre begins remediation of the former smelter property under the Brownfields multipurpose grant, continual virtual outreach with not only Pondre, but the surrounding towns of Sandpoint and Kootenai may be very beneficial. Um, but maybe Eric, you wanna talk about next steps and kind of what's what's next for, for you all. Yeah. <clears throat> So I think that's really good advice, actually, and and we certainly intend to to keep the community engaged. Um, but our next steps in the process is to move towards procurement for a environmental contractor to work on the cleanup, and as a small part of that, we'll be doing redevelopment planning for basically a park facility of some sort that will be defined as, as part of the cleanup process. Um, one of the things that we have to accessorize this project is we're working on an underpass of the railroad tracks and we were also awarded a build grant to, to design that. So it will be, be a massive compliment um, for us the trick for the city will be to create create a park that is that gives the people what they want but is also affordable and maintainable um, for the city particularly if we're not chasing the maximum tax base there's going to be some trade-offs and that's one of the things we didn't get to talk about but that cascadia helped us with with running the numbers in terms of how much uh retail redevelopment we can expect and residential redevelopment and so we're going to be working towards creating a balanced approach that includes pathways connecting our communities and a redevelopment plan that that works for the city awesome well i think we've answered all of the questions um but feel free to get in touch with us at info at cclr.org if you have further questions um, and that information is also in the slide deck. So thank you so much to our speakers um, for taking a little extra time to answer these questions and uh, for being with us today and thanks to everyone who joined the webinar. And fill out that survey. <laughs> oh yes, fill out your webinar survey. <laughs> thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Hi. Thank you Ayano. Thanks Eric. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.